bodhicitta and um, uh, reciting the uh, the prayer of going for effort in bodhicitta. O Sanye Chedan Soki Chonam La Chancho Bardo Da Ne Chapsum Je Dagi Jin Soki Pe Sonam Je Drola Penjur Sanje Drobar Sho Sanye Chedan Soki Chonam La Chancho Bardo Dani chapsum che dagi jin so ji pe sanam ji Drola penjara sanje drobara sho sanje charam So ji cho nam la chan cho paradu Dani chapsum che dagi jin so ji pe sanam ji Drola penjur sanje dropa rasho samjen tamje dewa tan dewe chutan tembara juluche donga tan donga ji chutan rawa rajuje donga mebe dewa tamba tan min rawa rajuje yerin chatan idan rawa Tanyon Chambola ne So now think to yourselves that we need to bring all of our mothers, all sentient beings throughout space to the state of complete and perfect Buddhahood. And in order to do this, we must um, achieve Buddhahood ourselves, but on a secondary level, we can also help while we're still ordinary individuals. Well, we're still on the path, or even before we've got on the path, better once we're on the path. It's, uh, we can still help, and one of the ways we can help is by translating. And so think to yourself that uh, it is for this reason to bring all of our mothers, all sentient beings throughout space, and in particular, those who speak our own native languages, our own the languages we're translating into, to the state of Buddhahood. And so please let's uh, listen and participate today with this motivation of bodhicitta. And so what we are talking about um, is translation in general. And last time we spoke, uh, two weeks ago, I spoke about mostly about the issue of thinking about your audience and whom you're translating for. And this is going to vary from work to work. Uh, so I mean, some things are going to be, uh, some things are practices, some things are aspirations, which are similar to practices, but a little different. So some things are Vajrayana, some things are Mahayana, some things may even be the foundation vehicle. Uh, you, you're, you'll encounter various different things that you need to translate uh, if you keep at this. And there are lots of different things to translate. So we have to know what is the purpose of the text and who is it aimed at? And then when we know that, then we can understand better about how we need to, who, who we need to connect with, how, what we need to, con, uh, to convey. Then the other thing uh, that I wanna talk about kind of on a general level, and I'm gonna focus a bit more on verse than on prose, partly because we, got started on it and I just had my translate I, because I'm totally into verse. I'm, I have to, let's get that straight out. I, I really uh, enjoy translating it to verse. And so that's just the, the basic thing, but also there's a lot of, uh, what are we saying? Uh, we have to have a lot of different tools. If we're going to be able to meet our audience and what they expect and what they need and what is going to speak to them, then we need to know how do we use our own languages in ways that convey the meaning of the text? Uh, as I said, I think the very first time we got together, uh, what carries the meaning is to a certain extent the words, but to a larger extent, it is the feeling that we bring out in the words, and that depends upon our technique, on our craft, our craft as translators. How do we use the language? This applies both in oral translation and in written translation. Uh, 
So the craft is a little bit different in the two, but there are certain similarities. And they certainly, of course, work together. When you're doing oral translation, you aren't going to worry so much about getting into the perfect literary quality, but you're going to worry about speaking clearly. Not spe My big one is not speaking too fast. Uh, speaking using words that people are going to understand. Uh, things like that, so that people can, it, so that what the guru is saying can strike them. Also, you can think about how does the guru speak and what can you do in order to convey what the guru says. For example, with the Yaman Karmapa, he has um, a way of speaking uh, where he kind of goes back and forth, noodles around a little bit before he gets to his main point and then brings that down. So if you translate that orally and you're thinking about how to translate that orally, you could, and there are translators who do this and it's not a bad decision. Uh, they take the meaning of what he said and they take out all the sort of back and forth at the beginning and just translate it directly. And that's very clear. It's very easily understandable. Or, and this is the approach that I tend to take, not, not entirely consciously. It's just kind of like what, the way, it's kind of my process of how I take notes and everything and how I think. It's like when I try, kind of try to, I, I kind of try to reproduce the going back and forth a little bit at the beginning before getting down to the point. And I hope that I actually get to the point, <laughs> right? So that's the, there are different ways of doing it. And, you know, you can think about how do different uh, teachers speak, like with Tronger and Bache. Um, Tronger and Bache has a very particular way of speaking. And there are several aspects to the way of speak that he speaks. He will tell you very clearly at the beginning what he's going to say and then the different divisions of it and go very logically. And then he has a series of, you know, because of this, then this, because of this, then that. And so then you can also like try to, if that's how your guru, the person you're translating for teaches, and it's not going to be the same as Tronger and Bashi, of course, everyone has their own different style of speaking, but you can say, well, how is it that that teacher speaks? And this is of course, a lot easier to do with people whose speech you're familiar with. So uh, that's uh, in terms of the oral translation. So there's thinking about that technique, pacing what you're saying, choosing your words well, and a lot of that, just a lot of preparation beforehand, um, and thinking about that as how to uh, convey not just the words that the, uh, that the guru is speaking, uh, but also the, um, also the meaning, the feeling that he or she may be seeing, saying, expressing at the same time as they're speaking. So this is very important. Feeling is more important uh, than people give it credit for. Um, I mean, on the one hand, I, uh, when it comes to your own feelings in terms of your practice, they're pretty much, you know, they're garbage. You shouldn't pay attention to them, even though it's hard not to do so. But when you're in a translator, you're trying to provoke people's feelings in order to get them to understand uh, the Dharma. So part of that was so in written oral translation, I just sort of spoke about it briefly there, but in written translation, how do we do that? Well, we have to use the techniques that we have in like we have our, our languages have rich literary traditions. They give us a lot of tools and we can use them. Now we all have different, uh, different ways of using language and people, if different English speakers, I have, because of my own personal background and predilections, I am uh, getting very, I have been very interested in metered verse. Other people are interested in different structures of verse or whatever. That's okay, but you have to use, consciously use the techniques, the literary techniques that you have at your disposal and that work for you in order to convey not just the literal meaning of the words, but also the feeling that comes with the words. Now, another aspect of that is that you have to have a feeling or you have to be able to get the feeling out of the original. You have to be able to read Tibetan and get feeling out of it, right? So this means that you have to have a, a certain degree of comfort. Now, I think that actually it's really helpful to start experimenting with this before you have a complete feeling for the Tibetan. And in fact, I have found for myself 
there have been some things where like I've had a pretty good understanding, but I haven't really had a good feeling. And then you start, I start transiting, start working. Well, what's the feeling? I start looking at it and then I look at it. Then it's through the process of translating in some ways as a way of getting uh, to understand and know and to feel the Tibetan work, the Tibetan original better, right? So there's that aspect. Uh, to, so it's not like you have to, okay, well, I have to get feeling. So therefore I have to develop feeling of Tibetan first before I ever start translating. No, you have to work through it in whatever way you can uh, in order to get the feeling. Now, as I said, I think in our uh, in a talk, uh, the first talk we had, you got to read a lot. You've got to read as much you can as you can in different different genres of Tibetan, um, just so you can get a, you know you can get a get a, a feeling. I'm using this word all the time today. You can get a feeling of what the different uh, genres are. There are the like in within the conjurer there is the teachings in the vinaya which are like one sort of feeling very very matter of fact just like telling everything like it is no embellishment no matter how crazy the events that they're describing it's just everything is like this is what happened this is what happened and then they read the, and then the the 400 fo frogs uh, died and reborn and, re and became our huts in their next lifetime and there's just it's completely straight you know, this great miraculous event happening, and it's just completely almost like flat. But at the same time, it's not really, it's not really flat. It's just, it's just no, no embellishment, right? So that's one. Then there's the feeling of like the Prajnaparamita Sutras. What are the feeling? Of, what's the feeling of those? And actually, it's different all the way through. If you start in life, you're like you're reading the, the boom, you know, the 100,000. One, uh, one good thing about spending time as a monk in a monastery is that occasionally we have to do things like read the read the boom and they give you you know a volume of texts and they say okay you start reading <laughs> and you just start reading as fast as you can <laughs> because everyone else is going twice as fast as you you're the you're the westerner <laughs> so you do what you can right and as you go through but as you do do that you know the beginnings of the uh, the text, you know, su mete su machiso, you know, whatever it's saying, uh, whatever it's saying, it's going on and on and on for a long time, you know, for the everything from su to namkin, you know, all 108 different categories of phenomena, and over and over and over again, and then you get to sometime later in if you um, take a look at the later volumes, it's different. Like there's instructions about how do you think about it. So there are different feelings, even within a single sutra. So you have to be, kind of look at what is like, uh, what is going on in the sutra. Then you have the, the sutras of the the third turning of the wheel of Dharma, like the, where you have all these descriptions of um, offerings and praises and some very profound things, but a lot of descriptions of offerings and uh, and um, pure realms and miraculous things and parasols and banners and all that stuff. That is just, so it's a very different feeling again than the Prajnaparamita Sutras, where the Prajnaparamita Sutras, they're on, uh, you know, they're sitting there on Vulture Peak Mountain, and there's not a whole lot of the discussion about, you know, the uh, various banners and pennants and all this that you see uh, in in the third turning the wheel sutras and then in the tantra it's again completely different and even within the tantra they're very there are there great differences uh the like the uh you know the Hivadra tantra and say the the jambo Tsenja, the uh, manjushri nama sangeeta are very very different in style so if you read these different things then you get you know a different feeling you can also look at the words of the indian masters you know and how are they they're often very technical so, but is it just purely technical, you know? And it's hard to get to, is there feeling underneath it? How is it done? How, how is it put together? Um, like the entering the way, the entering the middle way is actually often in Tibetan said to be very beautiful poetry. So when we translate it, is it gonna end up being beautiful poetry in English or in Portuguese or Spanish? Or is it just gonna be like blah? 
Is it just going to be the words, or are you going to try to get the feeling? So, um, and then in Tibetan, it's very different. Tibetan, the the uh, I've, everything I've been speaking up till now has been primarily things that were originally written in Sanskrit or in an Indian high, uh, whatever, some Indian language that was then preserved in Sanskrit or hybrid Sanskrit. When you get into Tibetan, then it's different. The Tibetan language is very different. Sanskrit is it's not very close to English or Spanish or Portuguese, but it's an Indo-European language. The morphology is similar. And so it's actually kind of easier to bring things that were rich. I find it's easier to bring things that were originally written in Sanskrit into English because the line, the, the, the source is different. It is, sim, is more similar. The, the way they're put together is more similar. When you've come to Tibetan, you've got an entirely different set of problems because the fundamental language, the, the morphology of the language is just totally different. The way they put the words together is different. And so they can put a whole lot of meaning in just a few syllables that we can't in English. And so how do we deal with that? But you've got feeling and you've got rhythm. So how do you get that? How do you get that feeling? So um, to kind of go through here, let me, oh, where is that? Okay, I want to go, I want to go back. And so I want to take a look here. Uh, this is again, starting from a, um, the conversation that we had last week or two weeks ago. We looked at this verse at the end, the Galdichus Yunani de la Migra Chiji Yu. Galdichus Menani de la Migra Chiji uh Chi Pen Senate in Tibetan, right? So when we look at the Tibetan, now this is a Tibetan it's a translation from Sanskrit, so it's different than uh than if it had been written originally in Tibetan, it's different than it would have been. They probably would have put it all on just two seven-syllable lines if it had been written in Tibetan originally. <laughs> but here it's on four lines. But if you look about what is it that's giving it its reason, it's 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 feeling. It's like it's the rhythm. So you've got the seven-syllable lines, and so this is the way Tibetan verse works. You've got, and it's the rhythm that uh, really carries it through. Uh, something a little bit further along. Where did I put it? I mean, you've got here. We've got the uh, like the uh, one that we all know. The Right? So the seven line prayers, you've got seven lines of seven syllables each, and there's the rhythm of going through it. So one of the things that really brings you through a Tibetan line a verse is that rhythm. So here we've got quick lines. We've got seven syllable lines. They're relatively quick. You're going to primarily find seven syllable lines and nine syllable lines in Tibetan. So dun sik tang gu sik yu Now, when you look at these seven syllable and nine syllable lines, um, you say, well, can we do this in, okay, I'm, I'm, since I translate into English, we say English. Well, what do we, can we do this in English? Well, actually, it's maybe not so easy with this particular uh, verse. I've had an, I have an attempt to, I've done an attempt to do that. I haven't shown, I haven't put it up here right now. Maybe I should show it to you later. But basically, if you look at English literature, one of the most famous verses of poems in, in English uh, literature is, is The Tiger by William Blake. This is often, some people consider it the best, the greatest poem in the English language. I don't know about that, but it is a very interesting poem. And if you look at it, how does it go? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? So what do we have here? We have seven syllables lines, tiger, two, tiger, four, burning bright, that's three, so that's seven total, right? Except for this last line, this last line has eight, right? So you've got the same number of syllables per line 
in English. It doesn't have the same feeling as the Tibetan, though. It's a little bit different, right? It's not exactly the same. On the one hand, you could say it's tiger, tiger. If you, like the Tibetan, how do we read the Tibetan? So you could read the English like that, tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. But it doesn't sound like English, right? The English has a slightly different. So when if we decide to use this form, and this is a form called uh, trochaic tetrameter, so four trochaic feet. Since you don't need to worry about the names of these different meters, in in Spanish or in Portuguese, I don't think. I don't think you use the these different meters. You've got to look at what you use in your own language. I'm using this as an English example. So it's similar. It has that same sort of ta 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 ta, but it's different. The English is a little bit square. In fact, the Tibetan rhythm might work better with Romance languages, and the reason why I say this, it would work well with. Um, with Italian, you know, uh, like there's the Puccini opera uh, Gianni Schicchi. And in Gianni Schicchi, there's the, the very famous aria. I'm sure you're going to know it when I, when I do this. And actually, the words of the seven line prayer very, fit very, they're almost exactly perfect for, uh, for the melody from Gianni Schicchi. <laughs> You get the idea. So, Gianni Schicchi was originally, originally written in Italian, and at one point I remembered the words, but I've forgotten them, so I'm not going to try to sing in Italian for it. But if it can work in Italian, Italian and Spanish and French and Portuguese are all related. French is a little bit different, a little bit, you know, there's a little bit, uh, but certainly Italian and Spanish and Portuguese. If you could do it in Ita with Italian, then you could do, if you could recreate this in Italian, then you could do this in uh, Portuguese and Spanish too. Right, but the point is here: we've got to be familiar with what the Tibet, the original Tibetan is, and how the Tibetan works. And you've got that rhythm. And so, in English, you could say that this uh, trochaic tetrameter is similar: tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. It's got a similar feel to it. So, it would be a reasonable thing to try to actually translate it into this meter. However, this meter in English is actually very difficult to make work. Trochaic meter is very difficult. In English, we tend to use a, um, a different type of meter, which is called the, um, uh, the, the iambic pentameter. Or if we go back to take a look at this one, it's you know in, um, in a different one, the way of the Bodhisattva, when something can be fixed, what need is there to be displeased? When something can't be fixed, what good is it to be displeased? So here, um, what this is, is this is a line of, you've got eight syllables on the first line, six on the second, eight syllables on the third line, and six on the third. But it's not just, in English, it's not just the number of syllables. We also have to pay attention to where do the stressed syllables, because English and German and Russian and a bunch of other Indo-European languages. You have some languages, uh, some syllables are stressed more than others. And so we have to, you, you can play with the, ry the rhythm of, of the stressed versus unstressed syllables. So here we have unstressed syllable when, then a stressed syllable some, unstressed syllable thing, stressed syllable can. If something can be fixed, there's like da 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 da, right? So that's a more natural rhythm in English, partially because we always put the articles before nouns, right? So you have, it, it helps us. But anyways, it just matches the rhythm of English better. And this meter here is actually the meter from, uh, of what we call a ballad meter or common meter. It's got a bunch of different names. And so here I want to show you an example. First, the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and I'll show you the first four stanzas. 
It is an ancient mirror, and he stoppeth one of th three. By thy long gray beard and glittering eye, now wherefore stops thou me? The bridegroom's doors are opened wide, and I am next of kin. The guests are met, the feast is set, mayst hear the merry din. He holds him with his skinny hand, there was a ship, quoth he. Hold off on hand, me graybeard loon, that soon his hand dropped he. He holds him with his glittering eye, the wedding guest stood still, and listened like a three years child, the mariner hath his will. So here, this is a this is a meter that was very popular in the what we call ballads, they like the Scottish folk songs from the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. And and Samuel Taylor Coleridge used this meter all the way through uh, the, the rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, which is a fairly long poem. Uh, it's probably, probably similar in length to the way of the Bodhisattva. It's uh, maybe, no, maybe half the length of the way of Bodhisattva, a, a few hundred stanzas. But if you look at it, it's all got that same rhythm. rhythm. It's, it, it is an Ancient Mariner. So they've got four stressed syllables on the first line, three stressed syllables on the second. Uh, four stressed syllables on the four, third line, and fourth stress and three stressed syllables on the on the fourth. And it's the same in every stanza throughout the entire poem, right? So we can do the same thing in in English with our translations. The beginning of the dedication chapter of the way the Bodhisattva reads, "By the merit of my having written the way of the Bodhisattva, may every wandering being enter the Bodhisattva's ways." And if you were to go back and forth between these two translations, be, between these two works, it would sound, on a rhythm, rhythmic level, it would sound like almost exactly the same thing. It is an ancient mariner, and he stoppeth one of three. By the long gray, gray beard and glittering an eye, now wherefore stops thou me? By the merit of my having written the way of the Bodhisattva, may every wandering being enter the Bodhisattva's ways. The bridegroom's doors are opened wide, and I am next of kin. Right? The rhythm is the same. So I'm taking an older English form, traditional English verse form, and using that in the translation, not to recreate, not to replicate the original Sanskrit or the Tibetan translation, but to try to give that feeling of structure that you have in the original in English, right? Because when you have that feeling of structure, what is it that carries the, the feeling, uh, or what is it that carries the feeling? It's kind of the rhythms, the feeling, the pacing of the words. It's just the pacing as much as the words that you cho choose. Now, the words that you choose have a, um, have, a, uh, uh, have a great effect on the pacing and on the feeling that you're going to be able to um, actually uh, uh, bring, uh, create. It's because uh, the words are, um, what do we say? You know, the, the words fit, have to fit. You have to make the words fit in what you're doing. But uh, you have to remember what, what are we trying to do? We're trying to convey the feeling of the original. So to convey the feeling of the original doesn't mean that you need to take, okay, Tibetan has seven syllable lines, therefore I need to translate into seven syllable lines in Portuguese. Good luck. <laughs> it's hard it's possible you may be very clever and may be able to do that and if you want to try excellent go for it <laughs> and in fact you should try <laughs> you should try you should experiment you should see what can i do but you have to go back and you have to look and see what is in the literature in my language now for, I mean, in the United States, the second most common language is Spanish, and I never learned it. I'm sorry. <laughs> and Portuguese, I have even less. I mean, there are actually a lot of Portuguese immig immigrants to the seacoast areas not far from where I was born. But, you know, and I had a, I had a, I had a Portuguese step-grandmother, uh, but she passed away before I was born. But I still, you know, I never developed a feel for it. And I know nothing about the literature in Spanish and Portuguese. In French, though, you would look at like the works of, you know, like Jean Racine, seven, was 16th century, 17th century. You would look at um, Baudelaire, Paul Verlaine. Um, 
You could look at Malarme. I'm not sure if that symbolist style, it might not, might work. But you, well, the point is, you have to look at the literature. So read not just the contemporary poems, but you have to look at the look at the classics. And the reason why you need to look at the classics is that they have the technique. You look at the technique and what do they do? And you read about poet, how is po how does poetry work in Spanish and French and Portuguese? What do people do? What are the techniques that people have? What are the meters or the rhythms that people use? You have to learn these and think about them. Then you have to look at how people deviate from those. What, what flexibility do you have in uh, doing, in, in playing the, in, in, in the meter? Where can you break the rules? Where do you keep the rules? How do you bend the, the, your words to match the form? And so this is what comes up in classical uh, things. And so as an exercise, at the very least, you should try doing the classical forms of your, in your own negative language. So in French, that's primarily going to be, be the Alexandrine, right? But there are other meters, I'm sure. I can't imagine that every French poem that was ever written was written in Alexandrine. There are other meters, and so you should experiment with those and see how they uh, were also put together. Um, because it's by uh, doing that that you're going to get kind of a feel for what can you do in your language. The other point is that when you have a form that you're working against, it actually gives attention to the line. Where do you break the line? In like an, in an Alexandrine, you have a, a caesura in the middle of a line. So what words can you put right before a caesura? How, do how does that match with the meaning? This is all very difficult. When I was in seventh grade in French, we had to uh, memorize a poem by Paul Verlaine. And my pronunciation is terrible, um, but I'll amuse you with it anyways. You know, it's like, oh, what is it? You pleure dans, ma, dans mon cœur comme il pleut sous la vie. Quelle est cette langueur qui pénètre mon cœur? That's about all I remember. <laughs> How does it work? You pleure dans mon cœur comme il pleut sur la vie. So you've got a line of 12 syllables, you pleure dans mon cœur, and you've got a pause, comme il pleut sur la vie. Quelle est cette langueur qui pénètre mon cœur? Right? Now also in that second line, you've got the sound, quelle est cette langueur? Right? And then you've got the qui pénètre mon cœur. Au bruit, au bruit du de la pluie, par terre et sous les toits. And that's all, that's, that's really all I remember, <laughs> right? <laughs> but so how does it work? When you're working in French, how does it work? And I can't do the same in Spanish or Portuguese, but look at your own literature and see. And uh, isn't Cervantes also a great poet in addition to a great novelist, you know? So look at Cervantes, right? Mm. And then also, but you should also look at the, at, the, at the prose too and see what the prose style is like. Like for example, Gabriel Garcia Marquez was, I mean, his the uh, Hundred Years of Solitude. I don't know what it was called in Spanish. I'm sorry, I read it in English translation. <laughs> so what is that? In Portuguese, you've got, I'm sure that there are differences in Spanish, por excuse me, in, in, what do you say? Portuguese, Portuguese, and Brazilian Portuguese, right? In Brazilian Portuguese, is there African influence? How does that work? What does that do? So if you look at them and, and think about what's happening in your own language. So in other words, before, in order to prepare to actually be able to begin conveying meaning, conveying feeling in your own language, you have to get to know your own language. You have to be, you have to be aware of the literary tra uh, traditions. Um, now, you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to get to the point where you can write a... Um, thesis on it or anything like that. You need to just be able to really appreciate it. If you have the feeling like you can read a poem in your, in your native language and say, oh, that really, that really struck me. And then you can look at the poem and say, well, how did it strike me, right? That's, that's what's going to really uh, help you um, uh, do this, uh, to, to get the feeling. Now, 
when we let's see another uh let's see so one and and then the other thing you can do is you can start um what do we say you can start practicing on how to how to uh, do all this and in practicing this one thing you can do is take a look at the um uh what do we say take a look at the common types of poetry in your language so here on this page which i'm showing you now that at the top of uh, the um beginning of the uh, the first two stanzas are from a poem by Robert Frost, who was a um, early 20th century poet, first half of the 20th century, really. Actually, he, he was writing poetry into the 1960s. Mm, he grew up in, or he, he was active in the area where, where I grew up. And when I read his poetry, it's almost like I can hear my grandfather speaking, just the, the way he the way he speaks, the way he uses it. Now, of course, some of the words are old and words that I've never I never heard my grandfather say the word queer. But the sort of the 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 rhythms and that you can get the feeling because it's that region. So you might also find this in your own language. Well, I mean, like in Spain, there are different great differences between the different languages that you get in the different regions and then you get over to barcelona and you've got and you've got an, actually an entirely different language you know so how do you what are the feelings of those in a different uh, uh different different languages at any rate here so this is kind of a a very straight example a very very straight iambic tetrameter so four feet of two syllables or eight syllables per line whose woods these are i think i know his house is in the village though he will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near between the woods and frozen lake the darkest evening of the year. And so here it's just a, that a very gentle sort of more quiet rhythm. It's not the same as the ancient mariner where you've got this, uh, cr this crazy old guy you know, reaching out his hand and grabbing the wedding guest. You know, it's, it's different. It's a very, the, it's more pensive sort of thing. But this is also a meter that can, I think, work uh, in Dharma translation. So here, one of the things that I've done that I, that, um, and that I encourage everyone to do is I took some of this famous one stanza praises and I experimented with, with them. So like first is there's the Chunji Manga Kudo Kar Zosanji Ulanjan Tuji Chingi Trola Zik Chenrizi La Chatsa Lo. So in English, if you put this in the same meter as the uh, as the Robert Frost there, it'd be unstained by faults, your body is white, a perfect Buddha crowns your head. Your eyes view beings compassionately, I bow to Avalokiteshvara. Right? Now, there are a little bit, there are a few little irregularities in there where I put some extra syllables in, but they kind of flow, right? So it's not strict. It's not, the, the Robert Frost is very strict. I'm not, I, I wasn't so strict in this, but you've got that kind of feeling, right? Or with the praise of Tara, So the gods and demigods bow down their heads to before her lotus feet. I prostrate to the mother Tara who frees us from all deprivation. So again, you've got that same rhythm. Now here, I don't, uh, I don't think that this is necessary. These are necessarily the greatest translations of these stanzas. There are kind of a little bit of exercises. I like the one for Chenrezig better than I like the one for Tara. I feel it works a little bit better. But the point is, one thing you can do when you're practicing is you can take all of these little praises of your favorite bodhisattvas and buddhas. And you can see, well, how does it work if I put it into, if I bring it into French or Spanish or Portuguese or Catalonian, whatever language you want to bring them into, right? How does it work? What is the flavor? How can I capture the flavor of the Tibetan in this language. Can I do it? And then you can also do it in trying different forms. So for example, here on both of these, I did them on the uh, on this uh, iambic tetrameter with eight syllables per line or four stressed syllables per line, really. The um, 
Tara is more strict. So what if I wanted to do them with a 10 syllable line? How would it work? How would it be with a 12 syllable line? So as an exercise that you can do on your own, you can read about how do you do this in uh, what are the basic structures and how what is the basic way that poetry works in your own language, and then try to do it with you using these little verses, right? There's so many of them. If you, uh, you know, basically there's one for everybody. Soft. There, there, there are billions for everybody. I mean, there are just thousands. There must be billions because there are so many praises of all the bodhisattvas. But we have three. There are hundreds that are saved in Tibetan. Our monastery prayer book has dozens that we're all supposed to memorize. So that's uh, another way of thinking. So that's actually kind of, uh, what do we say? Uh, that's kind of a, uh, I'm getting distracted. Um, th that's just sort of a general idea of how you can uh, work, with, work with it, just trying to experiment with things. So that's what these praises. Now these praises are short, but another problem comes when we're doing things that are originally in Tibetan. And so here um, is a different uh, set of problems. And this is the beginning of the white parasol practice by Karma Chakme. Actually, it's the beginning of the part that you chant. Um, there's, a, there are, there's a long bit of uh, Yikchung before it, but this is the beginning of the part that you chant. And so here we've got in the Tibetan we've got ah chuna masam jume tomba ni omgi tsembe do kar yong jur le jenzo tamie erme rani ne doji tsu to chirdo chemo ku right so here it's very very dense and in thinking about how do i bring this into english in english if you just sort of start out translating the meaning and you put it on four lines it's going to each of the lines is going to be very 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 long so i thought about it and decided i'd try to put them on each line of tibetan on two lines of english and the lines in english are a little bit shorter than the lines in tibetan the lines in tibetan are the gutsi right the nine syllable lines the english lines are uh, two, two, two lines of eight syllables uh, or eight or nine syllables. There are some irregularities. Um, but otherwise, there's just no way that I could fit it. Actually, uh, when I was do we were doing this for the prayers uh, that we did back in, when did we do those? In January? I'm kind of losing track of what we did when. Uh, so in January, we had these prayers of the, of the karma, and he translated this into uh, Chinese at the same time. And he also actually translated it on the each line of Tibetan onto two lines in Chinese. So uh, I figure we're, we're in good, uh, you know, uh, if, if His Holiness could do that, so can I. <laughs> There's some things His Holiness can't do, can do that I can't do, but if he can do two lines of verse for one line of Tibetan, then I can do the same in translation. I'm not going to try to imitate him in everything else that he does, but... <laughs> I'm not ready for it all, but two lines, I think, is okay then. And so here, you know, in the English, phenomena or emptiness, transcending speech, thought, and description. A gnome marks a white parasol which transforms and becomes inseparable wisdom and samaya, complete unjust remembering. I myself become the body of Adrashnisha, great repulsor. So catching a rhythm. Now, there are irregularities here. I'm not being strict with it, and I don't think that it's necessary to always be strict uh, in doing the meter. But there is like an appreciation of how does meter work? How do you uh, bring the rhythms of Tibetan into that? And so when you pay attention to that, then you can, um, then you can actually uh, start to convey the feeling. So... Basically, what I'm trying to say, and I think that, I mean, I know that all of you are in kind of different spots in your, in your trans, you know, uh, in your translation experience and so forth. And some of you have done more, some of you have done less, whatever. Um, and this might be something that you're not quite ready to translate to yet, at least not from Tibetan. Although you could try. 
because you can learn a lot from trying these things. It's actually very, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of like instead of, you know, spending your uh, day off, you know, doing crossword puzzles, you might as well just try translating a few verses. <laughs> But the point is that just as you need to know your audience, you also need to know how you can communicate with your audience. And the way you communicate to your audience is by the technique, the craft of translation. And part of the craft of translation that I've been harping on today is about verse. There's also a lot to do to deal with prose too. So you need to get you need to get familiar with your own language and the traditions of your own language. If you know the traditions of your own language, then you can break them. If you don't know the traditions of your own language and you just do anything, it's not going to hold together. So by learning the traditions, learning what works, what, you know, there's a reason why they used Alexandrine for so many centuries in French. They work. <laughs> There's whatever you do, that, that all the great poets in, in, uh, in, in, in Portuguese and Spanish, whatever they did, they did it for hundreds of years before they started doing free verse. And it worked. Why? You got to figure that out. Then once you figure that out, then maybe you could start thinking about free verse. But free verse doesn't mean what I see a lot in a lot of translations is you take kind of, you translate the meaning of the stanza in prose, then you chop it on four lines and call it verse. It's just, if it's on four lines, it must be verse. No, <laughs> if it's on four lines, it might just be like, <laughs> you decided to make it look like the Tibetan, but you didn't bother to actually do what the Tibetan, what the original does, right? <laughs> it's, we don't want that, right? But there is a tension because especially when you are beginning, there's a ten tendency to try to fit what you're saying to the structure of the verse and bend what you're saying too much and you end up with just garbage, absolute garbage. You will sound like, this is gonna sound horrible, you're going to sound like a 13-year-old girl trying to write poetry. 13-year-old boys are doing different things. <laughs> Sorry, it's, but you wanna sound like you actually know how to use your language, right? You don't wanna do anything maudlin. <laughs> So you've got to become, so you've got to read the poets, the the, po the classics, the current poets, you know. Um, another thing, in English, we have a number of books by great poets about how to, how to write poetry in English. They're probably the same in French and Spanish and Portuguese. So get one of those books and look at it and see. They will tell you, what do you do? And then you do the exercises. And when you write the exercises, you can expect that what you're going to come out with is garbage fine. You've got to do a lot of garbage before you can get to it and get to actually doing it. Now, one other thing that I want to say, just as a kind of warning, it's not the main point here, but one of the reasons for translating into metered verse is to be able to sing pra praises with melodies. People love to sing. When we translate into English, there are a lot of um, the students of Kempot Sutram, Jasper Rinpoche, and Pulun Rinpoche love to sing. But what they do is they have these translations, they get the meaning, and then they compose a melody specifically for each one that works with those words, which makes it hard because you have to learn it. Once you know it, it's nice. Before you know it, it's difficult. If you do something in meter, then you can do what we do in Tibetan, which is where you have, you know, dozens of melodies that work for Gutsi, dozens of melodies that work for Dunsi. <clears throat> You've got the Gurudang that works for just about anything. Um, and when you have all of, and, and so when you, you can know like four or five melodies and sing anything in Tibetan, pretty much. And we can't do that in English yet. Um, but there's a problem because you might be thinking to yourself, okay, I want to be able to sing the Vajradhara lineage prayer in Portuguese. Excellent. So you think, I want to do it with His Holiness's melody. Excellent. <clears throat> now you think, well, how does His Holiness's melody go? Okay. 
And then what you do is you try to fit words and you've got the melody in your head as you are doing it. So you're thinking, I don't know. Grande Vajradara Grande. I don't know. <laughs> Just how, how little I know Spanish and Portuguese. So, so you're thinking in your head, how do I fit? Or in, in okay, French, I might be able to do Le Grand Vajradara. <laughs> <laughs> right? What's going to happen is that you're, you will, if you are try to translate to a melody, it will not work independently of the melody. You will end up with a translation that people who know it with the melody will say, oh, this is wonderful. I can sing it with the melody. And people who don't know the melody are going to look at it on paper and say, what is this? I can't make head or tails of it. Right? You've got to, <clears throat> so in other words, if you want to be able to fit the melody, what you to have something that you can sing, you actually need to fit a meter. You need to fit the structure of your own language and then put that on the melody. So you need to look at, like if you want to do the Vajradara lineage prayer, you need to think about, well, how many syllables can I, like if you want to do it as an Alexandrine, it'd be pretty reasonable to think in Alexandrine is you've got two of six. So maybe there's some way to do six syllables, two sets of six syllables against his holiness's line. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, now maybe that'll work. Il pleure dans mon cœur comme il pleure sur la vie. Actually, it's easier than it is in English. <laughs> right? So, um, <laughs> so the point is, don't translate to melodies. Your translation will be garbage. That's basically all I'm saying. Translate to a meter, and then it'll work independently of the of the uh, of the melody. Okay. So that's the the main thing for today. So again, this is I'm I'm kind of speaking about general view, what we want to do as translators. What is the ultimate goal? At some point, we're going to have to start speaking about how do we get there. <laughs> so, but that'll be another talk. At any rate, uh, we have some more time this morning, so or this afternoon. So, um, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. You feel free to ask. Just. If no one else has a question, I would like to know because you were talking about the stress and unstressed syllables. Mm. So does that have the um, is, does that count more than actual number of syllables in English verse? Well, that's um, <clears throat> there are different ways to do English verse. Um, a lot of English verse is actually very strict to the meter. So let me go back and show you again here uh where are we at mm. i want to show you this one by the one by frost frost right so here actually his the whole poem is about 16 is, is six six or eight stanzas long and there is not a single irregularity in it uh so if you look at it actually i'm going to stress uh, uh i'm going to do all the stressed syllables. This is something in English verse. You guys don't, don't need to worry about this so much in your languages. So if we, I'm just going do the first two lines. So whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village though. And there's not a single, for the entire poem, there's not a single um, uh, irregularity. Uh, he will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. So you can do the whole thing. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village. No, though, of course, no one would actually ever read it like this. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. So this is one way of doing of doing it. And when you're doing, in English, when you're doing this eight syllable, the iambic tentrameter, there are generally fewer irregularities than in a longer line. There are fewer opportunities to have the irregularity. It doesn't work as well. 
if you have a longer line, uh, let me take a look. So let me go down here. I had a few other things that uh, uh, that I put here that I didn't get to speak about. Let's, let's take a look at Dylan Thomas. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age burn and rave at the close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. The wise men at their end, no dark is right. Because their words have forked, uh, no lightning, they do not go gentle into that good night. So here, the, the, um, the, uh, stresses are different. Now he has the same number, uh, number of syllables per line. So let me get the stresses here. So in this very first, um, actually here we've got a lot of stresses. When you read it, do not go gentle into that good night. So do not, so here the stresses, you could say do not go gentle, but generally people in natural read readers do not go gentle. So this is a comic te technique in, uh, used in English poetry where you invert the first foot on a verse to go the other way around. Uh, the, the other verse is like the next one, old age should burn, old age should burn and rave at close of day. This one is a much, much more classic iamb. Right, so this is showing you. So um, there is a regular there. So when you're doing this now, these are still counted as fairly strict uh, as a fairly strict pentameter with these variations, because they don't have any extra syllables. Um, when you go to uh, if you look at the at the Blake though, like Blake is different. It's uh, this tiger, tiger burning bright. Here we have in the first line you have tiger. Uh, oops, not tiger, it's tiger. And again, you have tiger. And then burning. So here you've got, again, four syllables per, uh, four stresses per line. And the first syllable is stressed, the second is unstressed. Um, and that carries most of the way through, except for right here, we have this could. Actually, the stress falls right here on frame. Could frame thy fearful symmetry. And this is like one of the few um, irregularities of the, of the poem. And actually, if we take it, the very last still, uh, there, are, there are a couple other stanzas in between, but the very last syllable, the last stanza is actually almost exactly the same as the first stanza, except he changes that one word that's irregular. Like that's a really brilliant thing to do. You've got your one, you've got two irregularities in the poem. And those are the one words that you change. Uh, so it's interesting. Like it's at the beginning, he's saying, "Who could make a who could make evil?" Essentially, and then he's like, "Like who would dare make evil?" It's a very different. What God would dare make evil? So it's a very different, um, interesting uh, thing there. So that's uh, a, a, an interesting use of an irregularity. Or if we go back to at the beginning, we have the ancient mariner. It is an ancient mariner, and he stoppeth one of three. Well, here we've got. We've got those, look, we've got, and he stoppeth one of three. We've got those, and, and this first uh, stanza, he's got these two irre uh, irregularities. So it is an ancient mariner, and he stoppeth one of three by thy long gray beard and glittering eye. So here, this is also kind of three syllables, but they sort of elide into two. And you see this, I know you see it in Italian. Um, when I was working in music, we, you know, the, the working music typesetting in Italian, you can elide syllables. Uh, when you have two vowels, at the, the, a vowel ending a word and the next one beginning with a vowel, it's often elided. Um, so it's similar in English. Glitter, it not, you wouldn't say glittering, you'd say glittering, right? Even though looking at it literally, it is glittering three, three syllables. So, uh, so you can, so when I do the uh, when I translate, I feel perfectly free to put in that same sort of irregular, uh, irregularity. I've got my elision right here. And another, another uh, extra syllable there. So here, I, you know, and I'm, I feel free to do more of these. I think part of it is that the rhyme of the ancient mariner is using a folk form, the ballad. 
And so in the folk forms, you're going to find a little bit more uh, room for irregularity. So in the way of the Bodhisattva, I'm kind of mimicking that. Um, and so I'm using uh, the irregularity here. But you have to be careful. Where do you put the irregularity? Does it really upset the line? Does it change the rhythm of the line? Because if you do the irregularity at the wrong place, um, it's just not going to work. Right. So you have to be very when you're doing irregularities, you have to be extremely careful about it. It's basically the the what do we say? The the main point of it all. Um, but it's I think it's it's better to use a few irregularities. I would rather use some irregularities than end up sounding like I'm imitating 19th century verse. I don't want to end up sound like, you know, someone like a 13 year old writing poetry. But do you think that it's also worth to experimenting writing our own poetry, not necessarily Dharma, any kind of poetry? And do you write poetry yourself? <laughs> <laughs> I write a few poems every once in a while. I haven't done too many. I mean, in the way of the Bodhisattva, at the beginning of my, of my guide, I wrote a short poem. And the reason for that, now that's an interesting one in terms of writing poem. And I, when I when I write poetry, I tend to do it in different, um, you know, I tend to use a more contemporary, actually it's not so contemporary, that's probably mid 20th century. It was contemporary when I was a kid. <laughs> At any rate, the, um, so yeah, I do it. And I, I do write some poetry, uh, like for Rinpoche's birthday, uh, when we've had big birthday celebrations, we would write, everyone would write poems and almost everyone would write them in Tibetan. So I did mine in English and some of them turned out okay. Um, and that's also an interesting way to do. I think, uh, and, and I, I would, yeah, please do experiment with verse. Um, but it's, of course, it's always better to do it in Dharma because if you're doing it, if you're like writing a verse in praise of Tara or whomever, a verse in praise of your teacher, and you're also thinking virtuous things. If you're just sort of, you know, I mean, I read a lot of English. I haven't, I haven't been reading as much recently, but when I, when I've read English things, I think these words are beautiful, but you know, it's just like, like Robert Frost, the words are beautiful. The sense is nice, but what is he talking about? You know, it's like what, you know, the, the works of Mary Oliver, a very popular 20th century, early, uh, late 20th, early 21st century poet, but she just died a year or two ago. A great poet, but, Essentially, what's she saying? <laughs> you know, so you have to be careful as Dharma practitioners, we have to be careful of that. But yes, please do um, uh, experiment with writing it. Learn, you know, learn what is the tradition in your own language and, and use it, practice it so that you're able to do it. Okay. Is that about it for today? So we will do this again, I guess, in two weeks. Is that right? Yes. Um, so that'll be what is the 14th. We'll do it again on the 28th of May. And we'll I'll think about how we, we can say if, if how and whether what we should, we should, well, we'll think about what we need to do. If you have any, if you all have any questions or anything specific that you want me to cover, you should let me know. I'm happy to do that. So I'm just kind of talking in general right now. Maybe I should talk a little bit more about prose next time uh, because there are certain things that need to be covered in prose too. So uh, let's now uh, dedicate the merit of our discussing translation to the um, benefit of all sentient beings. Let's dedicate this so that all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and great beings uh, may live long and their, their teachings may flourish and reach every sentient being. Let's dedicate this so that all sentient beings may uh, achieve the state of Buddhahood and until then uh, not experience any suffering and quickly uh, meet spiritual masters and progress down the path to Buddhahood. And let's finally dedicate this so that we may be able to um, 
translate in ways that will bring the nectar of Dharma to people in languages that they understand. Sunam di tamje sibba ni tomne ni be janam tamje ni kiega na ji balong trupa i sibbe tole drogun yudro sho. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very inspiring. <laughs>